morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to Inside the Writer's Studio, the podcast where we talk with writers about their lives, their craft, their business, and their latest work. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and our podcast is sponsored by Bookmarks. Bookmarks is a literary nonprofit whose programs include the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas. Come visit Bookmarks at our community gathering space and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Inside the Writer Studio is also proud to be an affiliate of Libro FM, the audiobook platform that supports your local independent bookstore. Stay tuned at the end of the podcast for more information on Libro FM and a special offer. I promised you something a little different in this episode, and here it is. Last fall, the University of Virginia Press published my new biography of Lewis Carroll, author of Alice in Wonderland. Lewis Carroll, Formed by Faith, is a religious biography which takes a deep look at how Carroll's faith touched every part of his life and work. To celebrate the publication, the Lewis Carroll Society in the UK invited me to deliver the annual Roger Lancelin Green Lecture. Rather than simply talk about the book, I chose to share what I called my Thoughts on Scholarship using examples from Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith. Here, then, is the 2022 Roger Lancelin Green Lecture. Charlie, a really very warm welcome to you, and over to you for your thoughts on scholarship. I'd like to talk today about three related topics. I think better understanding these subjects will serve the future of Lewis Carroll scholarship, or for that matter, scholarship about any historical figure. These topics are context, research, and vision. As you know, I've recently published a new biography, Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith, in which I examine the role Charles Lutwidge Dodgson's religious upbringing, education, formation, and beliefs played in shaping his life and works. I'd long thought that Dodgson's religion was absolutely central to everything that he did. And I honestly believe that if you asked him to name the most important aspect of his life, He would not have answered children's books or mathematics or photography or logic, but simply my faith. Yet this central aspect of the man, which underpinned all the other more famous sides of this multifaceted polymath, has been much neglected by his biographers, never getting more than a chapter or so in even the longest studies and often being reduced to a few sentences. Over a decade ago, I set out to address that problem And in the process of working on my book, I had a lot of time to consider context, research, and vision, topics which I think are key to the biographer's task. Each is sometimes overlooked or taken for granted, something we do at our peril, and what's worse, the peril of our subject. I'll be using examples from Lewis Carroll formed by faith, as well as a few that didn't make it into the final draft of the book to explore these subjects. I thought this might be a bit more interesting than simply rehashing a book I trust you will all want to purchase and read for yourselves. And it is a book, if nothing else, that cannot be summed up in a 45 minute talk. I'll begin with context, possibly because the most important of the three, some of the biggest misconceptions we have about Lewis Carroll and other historical figures come from a lack of understanding of context, the world in which they lived and worked, the broader issues that shaped that world, the details of their daily lives, the books they read, the art they loved, and on and on and on. Understanding context means first moving beyond the obvious primary source materials, and second, avoiding the trap of judging, in this case, a Victorian man by the standards of the 21st century. Mark Richards is famous, in our household at least, for noting that authors who write of the privations of life at Christ Church in the 19th century and how miserable those privations must have made Charles Dodgson and his contemporaries, are not considering facts, cold water, drafty rooms, and so on, in their historical context. Yes, by our standards, life in a 19th century college might seem uncomfortable. But to Dodgson, what we see as privations were merely the ordinary facts of daily life. A more modern example might make the point better. A teenager today would consider life without a cell phone or the internet to be a great misery. But I was a teenager in the 1970s and couldn't even conceive of cell phones or the internet, and I was perfectly happy. Likewise, when we say that the privations of 19th century Christchurch made Charles Dodgson miserable, what we really mean is that they would make us miserable. Let's look at a couple of examples of how lack of even the most basic context 
can lead to misinterpretation and misunderstanding. First, consider Lewis Carroll's most famous photograph, the well-known and oft-reproduced image of Alice as a beggar maid. How often have we seen this used by 20th and 21st century commentators to argue that Dodgson had sexual feelings about girls or that he was in some way sexualizing Alice Little? Before we even begin to refute this with obvious evidence from Dodgson's diaries and letters, the recollections of those whom he loved as children, and an examination of the Victorian cult of the child, we need to understand the artistic context of the photograph itself. It's quite clear from the details of the vegetation that this photograph was taken in the same spot around the same time and quite likely even on the same day as another photo of Alice in her finest dress. Here, even within the primary source material, we begin to see a broader context. The beggar child photograph is not a one-off. It is one of a pair intended to show the contrast between two children, identical except for their dress. One child comes from poverty, the other from wealth. The photographs can even be looked at as a theological commentary. Children are all equal in the eyes of God, regardless of their outer trappings. Nor was the idea of such a pairing something invented by Charles Lutwidge Dodgson. Images such as William Hogarth's Industry and Idleness did the exact same thing in the 18th century. And Dodgson's photographic contemporary Oscar Relander followed suit in images like The Two Ways of Life and a pair of photographs exhibited at the Getty Museum in 2019 of two women portrayed by the same model in a kitchen, one a serving girl, the other the lady of the house. Pulling back our focus just a little, giving ourselves even a sliver of context allows us to view the beggar maid photo in a much more authentic light. From Lewis Carroll formed by faith, I offer another example, the prayers in Charles Lutwidge Dodgson's diary. Some writers have considered the confessional portion of these prayers as indicative that Dodgson was harboring overwhelming guilt as a result of some major sin. How else could he call himself, quote, vile and worthless and wish to break the, quote, trammels of evil habits? But the diary prayer should not be considered outside the context of Dodgson's religious upbringing, of the services of the Church of England, and of the habits of other Victorians in recording prayers in their own diaries. From his earliest days, Dodgson was taught in the words of the family devotional cards, that, quote, all mankind are sinners and cannot therefore save themselves. This lesson was repeated over and over throughout his education and right through to his preparation for ordination into the diaconate. During term time at Christ Church, Dodgson attended the service of morning prayer most days. And even while on vacation, he often read family prayer prayers with his sisters and always attended Sunday services unless prevented by illness. Central to all of these services is the general confession in which Dodgson, on a near daily basis, confessed to having, quote, erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep and called himself a, quote, miserable offender. In the Anglican worldview, man is by nature sinful and will commit sins even in the brief interval between one day's morning prayer and evening prayer. These sins must be acknowledged and confessed and a resolution be made for amendment of life. The priest declares forgiveness of the penitent and the absolution, then a few hours later, it all happens again. Dodgson's diary prayers often borrow language from both the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer. And even that phrase, vile and worthless as I am, comes from a book of services from, for the canonical hours for Anglicans called the Hours of the Passion. When one looks at the diaries of figures ranging from Dodgson's friend, the Reverend Henry Perry Lydon, to the future Archbishop of Canterbury, Archibald Campbell Tate, similar entries occur. Lydon, by then a towering figure in the English church, called himself in the 1860s a poor sinner and most unworthy. Like Dodgson, the diary prayers of his rugby headmaster, Archibald Campbell Tate, were filled with confession and pleas for forgiveness. O Lord, receive this morning my humble confession of deep sin, he wrote in 1849. In 1847, he, like Dodgson, 15 years later, quoted 1 Corinthians 9, 27. How can I preach to others if I be myself a castaway? Prayers in Charles Lutwidge Dodgson's diary, which seem on first examination to reveal some monumental sin, are understood once examined in a broader context to be perfectly normal for a Victorian Anglican clergyman 
and very much in keeping with the prayers in the Book of Common Prayer, from which all Anglicans pray and worship. This all brings up another point Mark Richards made to me recently. He claimed that because I know not only had a background in Anglicanism, having grown up in the Episcopal Church and worshiped most of my adult life in the Anglican tradition, but also because I believed in Anglican doctrine, this made me especially suited to understand the context of Dodgson's religious life. I certainly agree that having a lifetime of experience in Anglican worship allowed me to see patterns, allusions, theological stances, and so on in Dodgson's diaries, letters, and other writings that might have otherwise escaped me. Does the fact that I actually believe much of what Dodgson believed give me an even greater insight into this context? I'm not sure I have an answer to that question, but I do think that to be a scholar of Dodgson's religion, which really means to be a scholar of Dodgson, one must be able to at least have sympathy for one who holds such beliefs. And I think it's fair to say that such sympathy is not always present in scholarship. In the pages of Lewis Carroll formed by faith, I examine the broader context of Dodgson's religious upbringing, the tension in the church between the high church and evangelical wings, and other issues that lend a greater depth of field to the understanding of Dodgson's life. There's no part of this study, from his preaching to his writings for children, his prayer life and his gifts to charity, his attitude towards Sunday rest and eternal punishment, that does not benefit from stepping back and considering it in a broader context. It's true that this often means a context that includes the politics of the Victorian English church. And while that may seem daunting, I had no wish to write an unreadable book or even a book that was only comprehensible to those already versed in Victorian Anglicanism. As, my, as Mark Goodacre writes in his introduction to Lewis Carroll formed by faith, and here I will allow him to blow my horn, at each point, Lovett patiently explains terminology, backgrounds, and contexts, and brings alive a religious academic culture that goes from being foreign to familiar. The entire book itself is, in a very real sense, an argument for the doctrine of context. I'm asking my readers to consider what they know about Lewis Carroll from other biographies in the context of his religious upbringing and beliefs, and trusting that when they do so, new insights and understanding will come into focus. To give a specific example of how our conception of one famous moment in Dodgson's life can be altered by considering its context, consider the river trip of July 4th, 1862, when he told the story of Alice's adventures underground to Alice Little and her two sisters while rowing up the Thames. You're probably picturing a lazy summer day and a string of lazy summer days filled with storytelling and river trips. After all, Dodgson himself wrote, Many a day had we rowed together on that quiet stream. But if we pull back the focus and view that famous day in a slightly wider context, we may have a different vision. Friday, July 4th, fell in the midst of a hectic week. Dodgson had had a friend staying with him since June 27th and had been a busy host. On July 5th, the two men would depart for a few days in London, where Dodgson would visit the international exhibition that was drawing tens of thousands of people a day. The Sunday before the river trip began, Commemoration Week at Oxford, with its various festivities and ceremonies. Dodgson had attended Commemoration on Wednesday with three to 4,000 other people. Being on the river with just his friend Robinson Duckworth and the three little sisters must have been a serene interlude. Step back a little farther, and we must consider that Dodgson had, less than a month before the river trip, preached his first sermon. Then, on the Sunday before the trip, Dodson attended a packed University Church of St. Mary's for the morning service, and to hear E.B. Pusey, his sponsor at Christ Church and an old friend of his father, preach. Given that Dodson was about to have what has since been called an inspiration of genius, Pusey's words seem especially relevant. There is nothing human in which man is so born out of himself, which is so little dependent on himself, in which he can give so little account of himself as the conceptions, inventions, combinations, and discoveries of genius. The mind moves not by an act of its own will. Even lesser degrees of ordinary men are conscious that it comes to them, as they would say. It is not of their own power or will, but it is given to them. 
Pusey's words are remarkably similar to those used by Dodgson in later years to explain his writing of the Alice stories. In his article, Alice on the Stage, he recalled, I added many fresh ideas which seemed to grow of themselves upon the original stock. But every such idea, and nearly every word of the dialogue, came of itself. Alice and the Looking Glass are made up almost wholly of bits and scraps, single ideas which came of themselves. What are, to, what are we to make of all of this? The river trip reconceived as a brief hiatus in a week of big crowds and major events. The recently ordained storyteller who had just begun his preaching life. Pusey's sermon on divine inspiration whose words seemed to cling to Dodgson years later. Context is not always about drawing specific conclusions. In this case, I leave those to you. But context can always give us a richer, fuller view of events, which in the past, we may have seen through a narrower lens than we realized. One of the ways we establish and understand context is through research. When we set out to research the life of Lewis Carroll, we most frequently consider his published writings, though far too often we limit ourselves to the most famous of those writings and neglect a massive output beyond the Alice books and the snark. His diaries, by which we must mean the unexpurgated version, and his letters, Certainly, this is a good place to start, and no serious Lewis Carroll scholar can even begin to do their work without access to the full 10-volume edition of the diaries, the complete published works, including the six volumes of the pamphlets, the four, so far, volumes of published letters, and a copy of Collingwood's biography. But the obvious primary source materials can only tell us so much, and what they often lack is the aforementioned context. The digital world has made consulting a wider range of sources not only easier, but essential for the scholar. Millions of pages of newspapers have been digitized. A vast array of obscure books can be consulted with the click of a mouse. Census records, parish documents, manuscript archives, and much, much more are available to us in ways they never were before. The days when a serious scholar needed a grant or a fellowship to visit faraway archives and a research assistant to sift through endless volumes of old newspapers are gone, and private funding is no longer essential for groundbreaking research. I myself remember spending long days in the 1990s at the British Library Newspaper Archive in Collendale, paging through volumes of St. James's Gazette and other papers. Now they're all available on my computer for a small annual fee. All that being said, it is important to remember that a lot of information is not on the internet. Just because we can't call up a document on our computer screen or by emailing a librarian for a scan, doesn't mean that document isn't hiding out there somewhere. Of course, I consulted all the standard primary source materials on Charles Dodson at great length and in great depth when setting out on this project. But many of the new insights and discoveries this book contains came from sources both published and unpublished, largely untapped by previous biographers. The sermons and other writings and speeches of his father, his schoolmasters, and his bishop. The books that shaped his religious life at Rugby. Church records from Darsbury and Croft. His ordination file in the Oxford Diocesan Archives. Secondary research on the churches where he preached. Sermons that he heard at key moments in his life. Books from his personal theological library. Press accounts of everything from Queen Victoria's visit to Rugby to Prince Albert's funeral and much more. There are several keys to moving beyond the obvious materials and consulting items which may be of great value to a particular field of study and of great value in establishing the context of that field. One is imaginative thinking. What might be interesting? What might shed light? And an especially important question, what has been overlooked for whatever reason by previous scholars? Many materials are easy to find if it only occurs you to occurs to you to go looking for them. I discovered the name of the priest whose sermons Dodgson heard on Sunday mornings while he was a schoolboy at Richmond, then found quite easily published volumes of those sermons. But I had to think to go looking for them. The same is true of the Pusey sermon on divine inspiration, which I quoted earlier. It was easy to find. What required effort was the imaginative leap that led to looking for it. My second piece of advice for researchers is not to discriminate. Cast your nets wide, you fishers of biographical details, 
for you never know where that tantalizing tidbit might come from. Materials as outwardly dull as parish records of deaths, marriages, and baptisms contained fascinating revelations about the work of Lewis Carroll's father, also named Charles Dodgson. For instance, the parish registers show that though his pay as rector of Croft, where he moved in 1843, was much higher than his perpetual curate of Darsbury, his first appointment, Charles Dodgson's parish duties at Darsbury were much more demanding. At Darsbury, the average total of baptisms, weddings, and burials each year was 119. In Croft, it was only 28. As Charles Dodgson took on more diocesan duties in the Diocese of Ripon, he hired curates to take care of his parish duties at Croft until he himself was performing only about 12% of these essential ceremonies. Parish registers look uninteresting, but carefully examined, they can reveal so much about the lives they document. I spent hundreds of hours searching digitized newspaper archives for relevant materials. I found a lot of useless articles, but I also found some gems. Research is like panning for gold. It might take a lot of pans of gravel to find that one nugget. When Lewis Carroll's father became a canon of Ripon Cathedral, with an additional salary and the requirement that he spend three months a year in Ripon, one of his parishioners was so angry at Reverend Dodgson's perceived neglect of his parish in Croft that he wrote a letter to the editor which concluded, the only good part of the story is that the Reverend C.D. is so highly beloved by the greater part of his parishioners that if agreeable to himself, they would not object to change his three months absence into a permanent one. From a musty old newspaper comes a new insight into life in Dodgson's parish. Another key to research is persistence. Often the items that will shed new light are not easy to find. If they were, someone would have looked at them already. Keep looking, keep contacting librarians and archivists. I had assistance not just from librarians at places like the Bodleian and the British Library, but from the Rugby School Archives, the Worcester Public Library, the Oxford Diocesan Archives, and many more. There's hardly a library in the world that doesn't have something that you won't find anywhere else. And sometimes the item you need or didn't know you needed is not in a library at all. Private collectors, book dealers, and auction houses all still play an important role in scholarship. I ended up purchasing several items from dealers and auction houses during the course of my research. And while that fact may undermine my point that scholarship is a level playing field, it is at least a more level playing field than it once was. Chief among my finds at dealers and auction houses were things like the single surviving copy of Lewis Carroll's father's pamphlet for preparing young people for confirmation, an incredible blueprint for how he taught his children the tenets of Christianity, a copy of the rugby school lists that carefully charts young C.L. Dodgson's progress through the school, and a set of manuscript notebooks by James Tate II, Lewis Carroll's schoolmaster and housemaster at Richmond Grammar School, which includes outlines of and excerpts from lectures and lessons Tate gave to his students. These all became essential resources, and only by keeping a careful eye on the market, a part of that persistence I mentioned, did I discover their existence. Fourthly, keep following the trail. So often finding the item I thought I was looking for was only the first step. In the Oxford Diocesan Archives, I examined Dodgson's ordination file, but that was hardly the end of the story. That file told me what theological lectures Dodgson had attended. So I researched the lecturers and their subjects. I also searched beyond Dodgson's own file, hoping I might find an ordination examination given by Bishop Samuel Wilberforce. Wilberforce, who ordained to Dodgson as a deacon in 1861, famously conducted his ordination examines examinations viva voce, leaving no paper trail. But sure enough, after searching folder after folder, I discovered a written deacon's examination, probably from a candidate who was unable to travel to the ordination retreat at Cuddiston. That examination gave me extremely useful information about what Dodson's oral examination would have been like. Finally, luck can be extremely helpful to the researcher, but I learned something working on this book. Luck comes to those who use their imagination, who cast a wide net, who practice persistence, and who keep following the trail.
I could fill many lectures talking about how I researched Lewis Carroll formed by faith. But for today, a pair of examples will suffice. Nothing had ever been written about Charles Lutwidge Dodgson's confirmation, essentially the coming of age right in the Anglican church. When the promises made in his name by the confirmand's godparents at infant baptism are taken on by himself. Dodgson, I discovered after much research, was conformed, confirmed at Rugby on June 1st, 1847. Two books were especially key in understanding Dodgson's preparation for confirmation. One was Instructions in the Doctrine and Practice of Christianity by then rugby master George Edward Lynch Cotton, who was responsible for, for preparing the boys for this rite. And the other was a book of sermons preached on the topic of confirmation in the weeks leading up to the service by headmaster Archibald Campbell Tate. I found a copy of Cotton's book fairly easily, but Tate's eluded me. I could find no copy on the secondhand market, nor did WorldCat list a single copy at any of thousands of libraries. Frustrated, I began to think about Tate in a broader context. After rugby, he became Bishop of London and then Archbishop of Canterbury. The official London residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury is Lambeth Palace on the south bank of the Thames. Did they have a library or archive, I wondered? A quick inquiry confirmed that they did. And that furthermore, they had two copies of Tate's book of confirmation sermons. They, sc they scanned a copy and a few days later, I was reading it. This led to further revelations and I decided on my next trip to London to pay a visit to the Lambeth Palace Library to see what else might be lurking there. Imagine my delight when I discovered that they had manuscript notebooks of all of Tate's lectures and sermons delivered to rugby boys on religious subjects during Dodgson's years there. It was an amazing resource. I learned more about Dodgson's religious education at rugby than I ever thought possible, all from notebooks which hadn't been examined in over a hundred years, and all less than half a mile from the spot where the Lewis Carroll Society had been founded. Some research triumphs are the result of such outside the box thinking, not just about what might be relevant, but about where such materials might be hiding. Others are sheer luck. For anyone working on a book about Charles Lutwidge Dodgson's religious life, surely the holy grail of research successes would be to find a complete copy of a sermon by Dodgson. No manuscripts survive in the family collection or elsewhere. I was unable to trace any press accounts of his many sermons. His diary contains only an outline of his first sermon, helpful but cryptic in places. I had just about given up when, looking for something else entirely, I came across a reference to an early 20th century magazine that included an article about Lewis Carroll as a preacher and, allegedly, the text of a sermon he delivered. Skeptical, I went looking for the magazine, which seemed to survive only in the British Library. I sent a note to my contact there, and he called up the bound volume and took photographs of the relevant pages. Days later, I was staring at what claimed to be the full text of a sermon by Dodson, reconstructed by the clergyman for whom he had preached it. It's not the same as a manuscript in Dodson's own hand, but it was a remarkable find nonetheless. And the sermon is reproduced in its entirety in Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith. I'd like to make one other plea to researchers. Please document your sources. I much prefer a book that is overladen with endnotes to one which leaves me asking, how do we know that? I can't tell you how many times I found in a Lewis Carroll biography something stated as fact with no attribution, no indication how or where the biographer discovered that alleged truth. This often meant I had to spend hours or days digging, trying to follow the path of a previous scholar with no map or compass. As scholars, our job is not to leave our successors wandering in the wood where things have no name, but to lay a clear path so that they can then move forward, building on what we have done. The worst mindset for a scholar is to think you are having the final say. The best is to think you are laying the groundwork for others to build upon. I certainly don't intend Lewis Carroll formed by faith to be the last word on Dodgson's religious life. On the contrary, I hope it will be the book that opens the field up for others to study in even greater depth. And I hope I have marked my trail well for those future scholars. Context and research are perhaps not that difficult to understand. Any scholar can easily apply the advice I have given on these two topics to their work. 
Vision, on the other hand, can be a little more difficult to get a handle on. Vision is not simply something that can be looked up in a library or an archive. Vision is not necessarily about pouring over source materials. It can just as easily mean sitting alone in a quiet room and thinking. But vision is essential if we want to continue to take scholarship in new directions. We cannot simply share the vision of scholars past and rest on their conclusions. Vision requires that we take what we discover and see our subject anew. But vision is not about setting out to prove a thesis. Having your own preconceived notions is as limiting as resting on those of previous scholars. And as biographers, we must understand that a life does not set out to prove a thesis. Part of vision is setting out to discover what you can and drawing conclusions from all that you discover, not just the parts that contribute to your preconceived notions. Vision is about seeing beyond previous assumptions, including your own, and it begins by not taking anything for granted. If an assumption or an accepted piece of common knowledge about your subject is not clearly supported by the primary source materials, it shouldn't be allowed to cloud your vision. But we constantly make assumptions not only about our subjects, but also about the materials we might consult. Any bookseller, book collector, probably even any religion professor will happily tell you that there is nothing more boring than an old volume of Victorian sermons. It's such a cliche, I've actually heard people say, such and such is as dull as an old book of sermons. Vision requires that we place ourselves in a world where such books were not considered the epitome of boredom, a world where such books were written, published, read and reread, and where people wrote letters to the editor about them and argued about them around the dinner table. Vision requires understanding that what might seem insignificant to us today held great significance in its time and must be understood to give us a clear picture of that time. I chose this particular example because I read scores of Victorian sermons while working on Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith, mostly from volumes that hadn't been opened in a century or more. Sermons by Archdeacon Charles Dodson, Bishop Samuel Wilderforce, E.B. Pusey, Scott Surtees, James Woodford, Archibald Campbell Tate, and many others all contributed to my understanding of Lewis Carroll's faith journey. As a scholar, it's my job to have the vision to see the value in this material. As a researcher, it's my job to read it all. And as a writer, it's my job to make what to a modern reader could seem like the driest thing I know, not only interesting, but revelatory. Vision also means looking at your subject from a different angle, especially if your subject died over 120 years ago and has been subjected to scholarly scrutiny more or less ever since. If you set out to write a book about how Lewis Carroll told a story to some girls while rowing up the river and then got that story published, you aren't exactly breaking new ground. Yet sometimes in our quest for a new angle, we overreach. If you set out to write a book about how Lewis Carroll was a space alien from the planet Meldork, whose story was a coded history of the universe, you have overreached. How then do we focus our vision on a new angle without going off the deep end? How do we balance vision with the historical record? When you're developing a new vision, when you're alone in that quiet room thinking, it's important not to censor, censor yourself. But before you take that vision and spend a decade turning it into a book, it's good to run it through three filters, novelty, relevance, and truth. My vision was of a man who had been trained as a Christian all his life, for whom the tenets of Christian faith, and especially the idea that God was a perfectly loving God, lay at the center of his being and undergirded all that he did. This was not a hypothesis I was trying to prove, because I had come to this conclusion after years of studying Dodson. But did that vision pass the tests of novelty, relevance, and truth? The first question was easy to answer. I had read all the major biographies of Dodgson and countless articles in Carolian and more general publications. Most mentioned that Dodgson was a deacon in the Church of England, usually without explaining what that actually meant. Some discussed his decision not to proceed to the priesthood or mentioned his sermons or prayers, but none had explored this aspect of Dodgson in any real depth. I felt confident that my vision passed the test of novelty. If I'd been planning to write a book on the fact that Lewis Carroll had wavy hair, I think it would be fair to question that project on the test of relevance. 
But seeing Charles Lutwidge Dodgson as a man of faith, it might not be sexy or as controversial as the claims of some scholars, but I didn't see any way it could be considered irrelevant. In fact, as I delved deeper into the research, it seemed more and more relevant. That left the test of truth. Was Lewis Carroll a man of faith? The historical record proved this again and again, both in primary and secondary sources. My vision was relevant and true, and perhaps most surprisingly, novel, at least in the depth of study I had in mind. And in this, future scholars of Lewis Carroll should take great hope. Even after more than a century of study, I found an aspect of Dodgson, an angle, a vision, that allowed me to go where other scholars had not gone before. And if I can do it, so can you. Don't assume previous biographers, even those whom you admire as scholars, found out everything. My particular vision led me to scores of sources essential to telling my story, but which had never been used by any previous biographer. When you look at your subject from a different angle, when you have a different vision, you see different things. You find different things. Many of the names you've heard me mention today, names of people who helped form Lewis Carroll's faith, will not surprise you if you're familiar with his biography. My book includes deep dives into the works and teaching of Carroll's father, of his schoolmasters, James Tate II and Archibald Campbell Tate, of his sponsor at Christ Church, Edward Bouverie Pusey, and of his bishop, Samuel Wilberforce. But other names are less familiar, perhaps. And in Lewis Carroll, Formed by Faith, I will introduce you to George Heron, who baptized Charles Lutwidge Dodgson. Charles Mayer, his form master, who died unexpectedly at rugby. Charles Abel Hurtley and William Jacobson, whose divinity lectures prepared Dodgson for ordination, and many others. Before I conclude, I'd like to tell you a little bit about one of those characters, a man who is not, to my knowledge, appeared in any previous Lewis Carroll biography, but who occupies significant space in this one, as I believe he was particularly important in Carroll's Christian formation. The Reverend George Edward Lynch Cotton. Cotton, an evangelical who had come to rugby school as a master in 1837, in the days of Dr. Thomas Arnold, was a constant in Lewis Carroll's four years at the public school. Each boy at rugby had, in addition to a form master, and instructors in various subjects, a tutor who remained with the student throughout his years. Form masters changed from year to year, but for four years, Cotton was Charles Dodgson's tutor. More importantly, Cotton was in charge of much of the religious instruction for the rugby boys, and in particular, for preparing them for confirmation. It was Cotton who awarded Dodgson the Divinity Prize, leading Headmaster Tate to write, his examination for the Divinity Prize was one of the most credible exhibitions I have ever seen. Cotton also awarded Dodgson multiple mathematics prizes and served as his form master for the fifth form. Headmaster Tate praised Cotton for much aid received from him, especially by his ministrations in the school chapel. In defending rugby against a charge of lax religious teaching in 1849, Tate wrote, if you really wish to know whether the charge you have made against the school is unfounded, I beg to refer you to such books as I have distinctly recommended in the school, e.g. to Mr. Cotton's admirable book of prayers and other helps to devotion, or to his short work on confirmation. Dodgson owned copies of both of these books and kept them for the rest of his life. In a scrapbook he kept as an adult, Dodgson pasted a picture of Cotton clipped from his obituary. Cotton's books are essential reading for anyone wanting to understand how the Christian religion was taught at rugby. But the most remarkable thing I discovered about Cotton, and perhaps this is why Lewis Carroll kept his books for the rest of his life and clipped his picture from the newspaper, was what Arthur Penren Stanley wrote about him in his biography. Imagine as I read this description that the author is describing not a school teacher from rugby in the 1840s, but the adult Lewis Carroll. His keen and boyish sense of life's mirthful side never left him. He was often the most amusing and laughter moving of companions. There was a natural and quiet flow of genial humor that overran and freshened like a mountain spring, the dry places and arid relations, the numbing cares and anxieties of scholastic life. But with all this, he was never frivolous or self-indulgent. 
the vein of ceaseless humor which played beneath an exterior somewhat grim and saturnine was combined with an intensity and earnestness of religious life which formed the chief feature of his character. It's a remarkable description that certainly could have been taken from a biography of Lewis Carroll himself. There's much more to say about Cotton, and that of course is why one writes books, so that one can say more than can be compressed into a single lecture. But I cite this example of an important influence in the life of Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, completely overlooked by his previous biographers, as an example of the sort of discoveries that await the scholar who approaches their work with a full appreciation of context, research, and vision. I alluded to the death of rugby master Charles Mayer a moment ago, and I'd like to end by looking at the death during term time of another rugby master, George John Kennedy. The death of a master in a boarding school community, as I well know, comes as a shock to everyone. The boys who gathered in the chapel the day after Kennedy's death must have been a somber group as they watched Headmaster Tate ascend the pulpit to deliver his weekly sermon, a solemn lesson on death. After only three sentences, Tate spoke words that are stunning in the direct link they provide between Charles Dodgson's teenage faith and his later works. What is life, said Tate? Is it all a dream? In his congregation sat a 15-year-old boy who would grow up to write the two most famous dream narratives in English literature. His novel, Sylvian Bruno, while not strictly a dream narrative, would explore states of being similar to dreaming and their relationship to waking life. In his 1876 Easter greeting, he would compare the passage from earthly life to life everlasting to waking for a dream. In fact, this idea of life as a dream state from which we wake to eternal life would occur more than once in his writings, most famously in the epilogue verse to Through the Looking Glass, which ends with the haunting line, which drives home this connection between earthly life and dreaming, and by implication, resurrected life and waking, at the same time, echoing the words of Archibald Campbell Tate, life, what is it but a dream? When I read those words in Tate's sermon, what is life, is it all a dream? I knew that I had a story to tell, and with context, research, and vision, I've done my best to tell it. This has been a special episode of Inside the Writer's Studio. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing my thoughts on scholarship. If the subject interests you, you can buy a copy of my new biography of the author of Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll, Formed by Faith, wherever books are sold. Inside the Writer's Studio is sponsored by Bookmarks, a literary nonprofit that runs the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas and operates a community gathering place and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. To find out more about Bookmarks and all its programs, visit www.bookmarksnc.org. Inside the Writer's Studio is proud to be affiliated with Libro FM. Unlike other audiobook platforms, Libro FM supports your local independent bookstore. Whether you buy a single book or, like me, a monthly subscription, you can link your account to your local store or to Bookmarks to support literary community. For a special two-for-one offer, go to Libro.fm and use the discount code WRITERS. If you've enjoyed Inside the Writer's Studio, please consider leaving a rating or review online at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Inside the Writer's Studio posts new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. On our next episode, I'll be talking to J. Ryan Strottle about his new book, Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club. Until then, thanks for listening, and may you read with wonder and write with passion.